qualified for the World Cup. Go and compete. Magic moments for the Republic of Ireland and their English manager, Jack Charlton. Sheedy shoots it in the net! Kevin Sheedy is equalised! Rifle pass, Shilton, the Irish are level. We'll prepare and we'll go and we'll do our best. We'll put them under pressure. And right, let's lost it! We'll put him under pressure. O'Leary doesn't hesitate. Comes up and scores! Goes down on his knees, head to the ground, and it's all green. It's all Ireland. They're through to the World Cup quarterfinals. And it's there from Ray Houghton. He does a ball over. Enjoy us, Houghton. And what a start for the Irish here. Just a selection of some of the golden moments that Ireland enjoyed under the reign of Jack Charlton with the Republic of Ireland about to play in Euro 2012. We thought that we should reminisce a little. So for the next 90 minutes, we'll talk penalties, pints and meeting the Pope as we <laughs> revisit the ups and downs of that colourful reign. Joining me on a trip down memory lane, three Ireland legends, uh, John Aldridge, Pat Bonner and David O'Leary. Evening to all three of you. Good evening. <clears throat> Smiling at that as you listen to some of those, David? Yes. Don't talk to me about penalties but you can speak to Aldo about points of Guinness no problem <laughs> I can solve that one out I'll talk about a pub <laughs> and the Packy the Pope took the uh, Packy the best so yeah. he wanted to see me he was a goal kick goal keeper himself so that's the man to speak to so when we, when we get to the Pope it's, it's just oh, me and absolutely. you talking about that he's the man <laughs> was it, a, was it a, a time that brought a lot of smiles oh absolutely fantastic it was just a great and, and when, when you hear that song it do you know, you go straight back to it and reminisce. Um, it was heady times, and you know, okay. you're, you're away to eight in 1994. We just see, see, we had we had we had we had a squad of players who, who got on infamously. We all, you know, really um, um, backed each other up on the, on and off the pitch. You know, it was more like a family atmosphere. There's no clicks as as perhaps there was in England at the time. We were just one happy family. You know? And I'd have to say, I was, I was doing something speaking about. Uh, um, about the way, say, the players now are travelling to the Euros, and you know the way they looked after. We we the set of players, as as John was saying, there, great players playing with all the the big clubs in the yeah. Premier League at that time. But they were a great bunch of people, and probably let the FAA were off with a lot because well, at that club level, the way they were, they knew where how they travelled to be looked after, and you know some of the stuff we had to put up with it and those FEI uh, trips was just <laughs> frightening and, but that showed in ways um, you know what people they were and I suppose that spirit and togetherness kept everybody together and probably if we'd have probably kicked up a little bit Roy Keane wouldn't have walked out uh, years <laughs> later if you know what I mean yeah. if that thing sorted out but they were it was a it was a it was like probably John or Packy would say it was a club for all of his international yeah. it was like a club atmosphere and everybody if you got injured you were gutted you missed the international match because you look forward to that next trip and look forward to the get yeah, we, we were always happy to come back to Ireland, yeah. back to Dublin for many reasons, the football for, for one, but also meeting the guys again and maybe going out for the odd pint and, and, and mm. <clears throat> reminiscing about what was going at club level. But it was a, all, almost a relaxing time to go back. We took our football seriously. We trained hard. Uh, and that, But we were so passionate about playing for our country. And I think that was came across yeah. to everybody. Oh, and even absolutely. the new guys who came in, like John and Ray. And that, it didn't matter. I think a week, John, probably, into being with the squad, yeah. you were felt part of it. Oh, and I think that was away. unique for an, uh, oh, with an Irish away. team. You know, uh, you know, obviously for me, me and Ray, you know, with the Glasgow accents and the Scouse accents, you, know, you go in and you're not sure, but but lads, arms round you, you know, right away, Kevin and and, and Liam Brady, back in the lads, Dave, you know, you, you take, took you took us in straight away, and you, you felt very comfortable, very, you know, right, right at home. Plus, we knew they were good Aldo. players. Yeah. We knew they were good players. Aldo was telling me about Dublin after about three days, so I knew he sat there. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? We used to, the lads used to, Jack said, you've got to come in for Monday training, Monday afternoon, Monday two o'clock. Yeah. Well, we get the tom tom drums out because there was no mobiles then. We'd come over on a Sunday, you know, to tell the wives we've got to be over on the Sunday. What we'd do, we'd have a bit of dinner and then we'd go out on the lash and we'd have a good Sunday night together, you know. And, and the then, managers, hopefully. <laughs> 
<laughs> they'd hope they'd get you back for the following Saturday's match. <laughs> <laughs> do you think? Do you think the, the togetherness that that you obviously displayed at the time? Do you think that was just because of how you all were as a, as a group of personalities, or do you think that was partly fostered by Jack's management? I, I think, look, I'd me runs in with Jack, but yeah. everybody says I don't get. On. I get on with Jack. I, I like him. I think I thought he acted stupid at times myself, but I liked him, and he. He was good for Ireland. He was good for the team. He came in and he had a way of playing and that was the way we were going to do. And his strength was really his easy goingness, in my opinion, off and the silly things he did that made the lads laugh and probably brought them together again. And he knew how to handle the players. And he knew, I think, going into the big tournaments, how to pl- make the fair players feel at ease. And there was yeah. a great togetherness of everybody want, yeah, wanted to do well. The other thing well. he did, Dave, and uh, you'll remember back to the early days before yeah. Jack's time, and <clears throat> I, I was probably from Donegal, but there was a group in from maybe England, like say, Jerry Payton and Chris Shooten and Tony Galvin, and those guys, and then you had the Dublin lads. And the Dublin lads used to go back, go back to their families in the afternoon yeah. to visit and did a wee chance to be over for a couple yeah. of days, so they went back. Jack stopped that. And I think it was a good thing because you had a group in the hotel and I, I had some friends there, so I'd go out and, and, and see them. The lads would be back home and it was a disunity. It's among a, I mean, that group. I never thought, but that, that's a good point, Packy, yeah. because mm. I probably was one of them that you would have that free time after training or after lunch and I would clear off and, t- and come back in in the evening. I'd either go and see, honestly, see my grandmother and see yeah. my parents and that way. And yeah, you probably lost a bit of that, and it, it, that's yeah, a good Jack point. Yeah, Jack changed we, right away, we and, and, and it brought everybody together. We used to go to the pictures together, we used yeah, to go off doing yeah. other things, go into town for a cup of coffee after training. We'd all go and do a bit of shopping, then we'd meet up and have a, but have the, a cup of coffee yeah. down in Mary Rose's, was it? I think the big overall thing, though, was you had a really great set of players. You know, right. They were really top-class players there, and uh, what you had that with then is a great togetherness, and... You know, they had to put up with a lot and laughed a lot of things off where I think you see what the way the Irish players are looked after now and it's not knocking them, it's it's right and professional. Mm-hmm. We could have been a lot better, but I think we were so tolerant, a lot of the players, that they wanted to play, they wanted to get on with it, and they did get on with and it. And in some ways, that brings you together as well, doesn't it? If, if you don't have everything handed to you on a plate and it isn't a lap of luxury, there is a kind of all mucking in but we, together. Yeah, we... we, 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 we a laugh different breed. Yeah, you, you have a laugh, laugh about it, yeah. don't you? We were different breed, you know, we... You know, very labour like if you want. We were brought up the right way. We mm. we had to, you know, fight for our corner, fight for our cause, and you know, fight for your position better. You know, like we all know what the the modern day player like. You know, they've had a I mean, silver three, spoon in yeah, the mouth. Yeah, yeah. But you know, we we were all right down to earth. All the lads, you know. it's a great bunch, really, and a fantastic bunch. And some of the things we we you know, after the game. We would all go out after the game, so some with, with the family. Sadly, some, the family. Sadly, yeah. you'd go out. <laughs> <laughs> we would actually go back into town on the bus and we'd get a priest escort to a club. Can I say this interview? Nothing like trying to get attention to yourself, <laughs> guys. guys we, we must not give away any stories here. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. no. Well, that, trust me, they will. They'll give away some stories oh, over the course of the next hour and a half. Let's go back to when Jack took over as Ireland manager. He succeeded Owen Hand in 1986. He decided that his first task was to recruit a new batch of players which as we've already heard included a certain John Aldridge when you take a job on to the national side you, you never know about the players that you're getting in there wasn't that many and I went Morris Settlers came to me one day and he said I want to go I want you to go down to Oxford he said there's two or three players there that you might want to use so I said okay so I jumped in the car and I drove down to Oxford and went to see the game after the match, I went and saw John and uh, said, would you want, like to come and play for Ireland? And he said, oh, yeah, I'd love to. And then I said, he said, what about him over there? This is Ray Houghton. I said, no, he's Scottish. No, he said, he said he's got Irish connections. I said, has he? So I said, Ray. And he came across. And I said, uh, you got some r- relations with an island? He said, yeah, my mother's from, my mother's from the East Coast. And uh, I said, well, do you want to play for, would you like to play for the Irish? And he said, yeah, I'd love to. I, I, I think the webcams are on. If you want to watch us on the Five Live website, you can, because watching David and Pat and, and John's reaction to, to Jack's stories is mm. going to be quite a treat this evening, I think. Um, that's how it happened then. You, yeah, Ray yeah. Howard knows. No. no. Yeah. <laughs> We're laughing because Jack got In layman's yeah. terms, yeah. No, it, John will tell you. We were playing at Aston Villa in the semi final of uh, the Mill Cup, which is the Carlin Cup yeah. now. And I knew Jack had gone to watch us at Villa Park and it was 2-2 and uh, 
he come up to me in, in the players' lounge, you know, Jack's coming towards me with this cap on, you know, this is, I was a little bit, you know, you know, intimidated with his presence, World Cup winner, and he, he came over and he said, oh, John, you know, um, Jack Charlton, the new manager of, of Ireland, said, yes, I know, yeah. He said, uh, well played today, he scored two great goals. I said, thank you very much. He said, do you want to play for Ireland? I said, of course. Like he said. I said, well, what a Dave, Dave Langan over there, he was the instigator. I said, oh, Dave played, the good lad, and he, he plays for Ireland. I said, yeah. I said, the lad next to him, Ray Houghton, he said, he played well tonight, didn't he? I said, yeah, his dad's from Donegal, you know. He said, oh, well, get him over here, he can have a game for Ireland as well. <laughs> Basically, that's how he got Ray. What he a, got two for a pairs of one. What a great player he was for. Yeah, oh, cool. you know, tremendous, what a absolutely great tremendous. Did, did you feel that he had an ad hoc approach to recruiting players for, for Ireland? I, look, I didn't. I didn't care as long as they're great. Who would turn down Ray Hout? Now who yeah. would turn down John Aldridge? Um, the one thing about the players was when they, when they did come over, um, no matter what, if everybody was. You know, there was jokes. If you flew over Ireland at that time, you'd, <laughs> Jack would give you a cap. You know, if you're a. But th those players really wanted to play and do well and. As I say, they blended in straight away, and and they weren't just people making up the numbers. They they were players that top players with the top uh, you know league sides in England at the time, winning leagues, winning FA Cups, mm. and ever. And they were they were. Quality. But the history, the history also is that before Jack's time, that there was a lot of players born over here, mm. <clears throat> uh, played for played for Steve Highway would have been one that, yeah. that he was actually. And um, Tony uh, Grealish, so Tony Grealish, yeah. many. Well, of you them. mentioned Chris Hutton, didn't you? Chris Hutton, of course. Mm. And Chris, no, there's no more an Irish man than Chris Hutton. If you sit and talk with Chris, and he was lucky that Brian brought him back to to be the assistant mm. manager, and he absolutely loved it. Uh, totally committed to the Irish cause. Tony Tony Galvin is another one. And Andy Towns, Andy, Andy Towns, all of those. But before Jack, oh, yeah. so it was a, sort of a, the history was there. And you know what? What you've got to remember, what what our history is, a, a republic is that people had to leave Ireland to go away to work and. Their grandparents and their parents over here uh, and they always felt very Irish and all of those kids who were brought up then became and I'm sure John your family's the same if you go back mm. far enough uh, they were the voted Irish people mm. uh, and for John to get an opportunity to come and play yeah. for his country like it's like my son or Dave's son or that and my son would play that under 17 and 19 level and he was he's got his jersey up on the wall and he absolutely thinks he's Irish uh, even though he was born in Glasgow yeah. so that you can never bring that away from that uh, that's, that's, a, that's a very good point actually that in amongst yeah. the, the the jokes that flew around at the time yeah. as you say about flying over Ireland the people ignore the heritage and 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 how much you do believe that you come from where your parents yeah. are from yeah of course you know, I, I always knew about me. my mum's family coming from Athlone and, and Galway originally. You know, we were brought up, you know, and uh, we, we, we were nurtured and tutored. Um, I mean, you know, I, I played with Mark Lawrenson, as good a centre half you, you'll yeah. ever get in the world. And, uh, you know, he, he wanted to, he could have played for England, he could have had so many caps for him, like a lot of the lads that came. Um, but he was just absolutely fantastic and he wanted to. He wanted to win everything with mm. Ireland. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's a good point, actually. But when you think back, we missed out at the European Championship with Jack. We qualified with Mark and Liam Brady, two unbelievable players. And when you go back to that qualifying time, probably jumping ahead now, but the team that we played Scotland up in Hamden was yeah. an incredible team. And yeah. I, I, I quote this team when I speak. Uh, Paul McGrath actually played right back. Yeah. Ronnie Whelan played yeah. left back. He was just, yeah. I mean, McGrath. Yeah. Yeah. There's so I, many there. But we had we had with Kevin, yeah. we had Mick, yeah, uh, we had Ray Houghton on the right, we had Liam Brady and Mark Lawrence in the centre and Tony right. Galvin left and John and Frank up front, all with Manchester United all Liverpool, wow. all won in championships. Yeah. I was in goals with Celtic, so we were in the odd championship. Yeah. Yeah. And they were all playing in European competitions. Dave would have been around, not not in the team, but on yeah. the bench. Uh, Niall Quinn might have been, I'm not so sure if he was in the qualifying rounds, but he came in. All fantastic players playing yeah. at a very, very top level in that team. So you could you, to get into the team first of all, foremost. Was See, a lot, lot of people also said the, the players, you know, that Jack <coughs> wouldn't allow us to express ourselves on the pitch, especially the mid midfield players, but his philosophy was when he went out to to, Me to Mexico World Cup um, when he, he got the job and uh, and he looked at the way that the game was played and he knew he had to play to a certain to his way and certain strengths and so we couldn't put the ball at risk across the back four or across the midfield. He stipulated that straight away mm. and obviously the full backs would get the ball and put it into the corner and I had to get the ball. We pushed up to the halfway line, the centre house, pushed it up and you pushed onto the opposition and you played them in their half. When the sweepers would get the ball, or the, the three at the back, I was asked to chase the three of them, chase the ball. 
and had that sort of run around like a chicken with no head to, to, to chase the ball. But straight away, what that led to other people coming on top. Yeah. So all of a sudden, we we had this this uh, theme of, of of playing, and every team, but every team on the planet hated hated playing against us because they were used to getting time on the ball. We were in the faces all the time. And, and did you find it difficult to fit into that way of, of playing if it was in contradiction to how you played at club level? Well, look, I was not the type of centre-half that Jack wanted or yeah. Mark Lawrence. I mean, mm. I remember Jack telling me, you go and pass the ball to your other centre-half like you do at Arsenal, I'll have you off the pitch. <laughs> and, uh, and that was yeah. Jack. That's not... not he, what, the one thing Packy was saying about the teams of earlier and the, the great players were in that... We never qualified for any. We we were very unlucky in one year where we got a load mm. of points and we got done by on goal difference on, by France. But the big thing that Jack came in and said, "This is my team. I'm going to manage, and this is the way we're going to do it. Mm. And if you don't like it, that's it, and that's that's the way it was. Now, you know, was it was it total football? Was it you yeah. know this cosmic? No way. But it was effective for what he wanted, mm. um, and that's what he got out of it. And if you didn't like it, so. You know, the Mark Lawrence or myself, Mick and Kevin, no disrespect to them, different type of centre-half. Yeah. More like Jack's centre-halves. They fitted Jack's way mm. um, better. The Liam Brady, as great a player as you could get Ireland's ever had. Mm. Now, was he Jack's ideal player of coming and getting her off the back foot? Jack didn't want that. No, no, he didn't. It's not saying Liam Brady. He's not saying Liam Brady was a bad player. No. It's just he didn't fit the what way. He, what he tried Jack to do with Liam, play. he tried to change Liam. Liam was later in his career, so he was never going to maybe a, adjust properly. But he tried to change Liam a little bit to get the ball off the off the front players or, or further up the pitch. Mm. Liam was used to dropping back a bit, like what Johnny Giles did, yeah, and, yeah. and how he's played the game uh, yeah. originally under Johnny to go back, get it off the centre halves and play. Jack didn't want that, and but John's point. I think it's crucial is that Jack looked at the opposition that played in the Mexico World Cup he looked at the European teams and said if we put the ball at risk these teams score n- make it off a score we're never going to get it back so let's play differently and let's get in their faces high up the pitch and this was the big big thing and he made it simple for us mm. because that's how we did it some of the, some of the games Packy, I remember West Germany in one game with that and he said you know how these are going to play you know Franz Beckenbauer was the man you know, Franz, he was tippy tappy player, and they're going to play tippy tappy stuff. And I remember we were against Italy, it was Baresi, Maldini playing. He said, You know, the way these Baresi and Maldini is going to be tippy tappy. And that told you about Jackie. Didn't like that tippy tappy stuff at the uh, back. And don't forget, you mentioned uh, Baggio, but he called him Baggio. He was describing this great uh, Spanish player in that group, uh, Michelle, and he was going, This Michael, this Michael, <laughs> this Michael is that way. I think some of the lads were saying Michael wasn't even playing today. I think he was injured and Jack hadn't, but, hadn't been involved. Yeah, going back on Liam Brady, there's, a, there's a, a great example of what we're talking about. Liam's testimonial was against Germany, West Germany uh, at the time. And uh, Liam played, although he was getting phased out. Um, and <laughs> we win him 1-0, and, and he, get, he put the ball at Richard across mid- midfield. They made it one all. It was Liam Sessler, Jack substituted before, <laughs> before <laughs> half-time. Yeah, it wasn't. Before half-time, which was, yeah. oh, it wasn't what everyone expected, you know, at least we till half-time. Yeah. But yeah. No, Jack, Jack made, yeah. made a massive example. I think we, we, I think we came in that yeah. time, we were all looking at each other thinking... You know, yeah. you could have waited the yeah. whole time yeah. stuff. Be more diplomatic than that. But that was Jack's way again. That was he Jack's was very to the point. Yeah. How did, Liam, how did Liam react? Oh, he wasn't a happy. Well, no. No, no, no. I think it's a long time ago. Thinking back, um, you know, remembering the dressing room. No, and look, if it had been any of us, I don't think we'd have been happy personally yeah. ourselves either. Uh, let's go back to when uh, the world sat up and took notice of Jack Charlton's Ireland. Then the date, the twelfth of June, nineteen eighty-eight. The place, Stuttgart. And the final whistle goes. And my heaven, it's a great day for the Irish. And one of the heroes of 1966 has undone his own country. Jack Charlton has taken the Republic of Ireland to an historic victory. If, if people listening, uh, I don't know, maybe coming back from the bank holiday weekend, kids sat in the back of the car, they, they probably won't get just what a historic day that was. I mean, I can remember sitting watching that game thinking, you know, and being genuinely gobsmacked by it. Ireland won, England nil, Ray Houghton's early header. Ireland's opening game in a major tournament, Pat. Yeah, of course, and uh, we didn't know what to expect. It was our, it was such a, 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 an incredible day for us, our first uh, major championship against England. 
and everybody of course in Ireland wanted to beat England that time I know it's different here uh, but for us to get off to such a start we got I think it was after about 8 minutes or so yeah. uh, Ray scored a, a goal and again it was a ball played down to the left but I think Kevin Moore played it and it was knocked down and it was a bit of a scrappy goal but Ray finished it really well over Peter yeah. Shilton um, and then we had to hang on for the next we were never going to maybe score I don't know if we had that had many few, chances we had, we had a few half chances, chances. Yeah. Yeah. but we weren't opening England up by any means no, no, but no, we no. felt very comfortable going into the game and the fact that we were playing England because it was going to be like a, a normal English type game with yeah, our, like a our derby was yeah a derby game and our guys playing in the English league I was probably the only one and, and uh, the maybe expectation that was on England yeah. in the, in the, for all the, the great yeah. players we had the expectation was and the, the game I it's think probably I, a hard game yeah. for England but England will win it yeah. but we yeah. believe in ourselves we, we, we know in the dressing room you look around you see Paul McGraw you want to be on the same side as it he was unbelievable that day you know and we look, all looked at each other and we, we knew we were a match for England that day yeah. you know, they might have a little more, more flamboyance than us but we, we really and I think, I think the other incredible thing that England left Glenn Hoddle out of the team I think they played Neil Webb yeah, that particular did, day in the middle of the pitch alongside yeah, Brian Robson. Point, yeah, and we, we, we were shocked with that. We said, well, how, how can you let Glenn Hoddle out? And then suddenly, by the time half time came, we were pretty tired after chasing him down and then on comes Glenn Hoddle. And we had to still yeah. hang on for another, uh, sort of another no, 40, no, no, 40 minutes. About Hoddle. Yeah, yeah. 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 Could, but you, you did actually, Packy, Packy, you know, he's not mentioned many people. He pulled off a couple of cracking saves mm. from, from Gary Lineker in particular didn't you I, I actually I had a good game I, I will admit I had a good game <laughs> and that I, was, I, you know the, what, what a win and it was really uh, that, that sent England on to a very disappointing yeah. start of a very yeah. disappointing championship for they, they had a dreadful yeah, they had a dreadful championship I mean what what were they like on the pitch whilst you, could you sense them getting more and more frustrated yeah yeah without doubt you know it, I think it was always important that we got the first goal that goes without saying but uh we all know that the, the pressure that's put on England. We we, we know the hype and, and and the media, which have never been friendly towards them. They're always looking for something to go on and make it harder for them. And I, I remember Tony Adams, you know, leaving to go to that tournament, and he'd come back a different bloke. You know, he'd, yeah, come back definitely. He, he, there was still in pre-season and going into the following season, there was a follow-up of, you know, the the disappointment and how England played, how he played. The stick they got afterwards. To a hammer, didn't he? Yeah, and they really, he come back with his confidence really being So, knocked. So from your point of view, did, you know, you hear these stories, players come back from tournaments, different nationalities in the dressing room, there's a bit of banter, there's a bit of Mickey taking after a tournament. Mm. Did you actually sense, because he was different, that yeah, I you left well, I, left I well alone? You, 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 know, you know, I mean, dressing rooms are a cruel place. Yeah. You know, you've <laughs> got to stand up and, you know, take the banter and the stick and everything else. But at times... In general, most dressing rooms are a decent bunch of people, and they suss out when, you know, it's not. And you could see with Tony he'd been put through the shredder, like a lot of the England players mm. uh, through that summer. Uh, yeah, after we had, yeah, we had Barnsley and Beasley uh, and, and, and yeah. Steve McMahon. So yeah. We just yeah. hammered them. <laughs> <laughs> me, 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 Ray, and Ronnie just hammered them. It's great. <laughs> but it was that, that was you know that was a big game. There, yeah. there was more to it than just a game. There was. Everybody knew each other on the pitch, and mm. it was such a rivalry. The other interesting one in that first game was that Terry Butcher was actually missing also, and Mark Wright played in that game. Terry yeah, didn't right. actually play, in, and he was a he was a big big player for them, the captain, of course, and so on. So that gave us a lot of confidence before we went into the game too, with Glenn Hoddle and Terry Butcher missing from that particular lineup. I mean, you went toe to toe in that group. I mean, take England out of it, the other two sides in that group were, mm. were two of the great teams of Europe at the time, weren't well, they? Yeah, I, mean, yeah. I mean, the the Dutch were the best team in Europe. I mean, but the Soviets weren't that bad either. And you you got a they a, were a, they were a great team. They were they were so a really good against team. against Russia. We played probably. The best 90 minutes of football under Jack Charlton yeah. that day. We, we drew one all. You were one up with 16 minutes yeah, left. That's right, yeah, they, they scored pretty late. I, I missed the a, golden a chance and all of that. I don't know if I should have scored. But, uh, but we played, we, and we actually played football. In, we, so, so we got it yeah. down and, and played to a certain degree. Jack's well, not tactics, Jack right, John, Jack's tactics I, played, I thought it was spot on they played with a sweeper and we, we he was worried about that because what they used to do is play out the sweeper play to the full back get us pulled across one side and then back to the sweeper and change it across the other side and then his, his mantra was always they would get players running so what he stopped 
was them changing the play because Ray would yeah. stay wide on the left or on the other side and it stopped their game completely and they would knock it back to Dasyev and he would knock it down the middle and Kevin or yeah. or, or, or Mick would have won yeah, the yeah. ball and we played and we played fantastic football on that play tonight. Oh, yeah. sure. and that, it, was a, it was a hard group as Pac- they, they were, they were good good real real good teams in that group well you were, you were with eight, eight, within eight minutes of drawing yeah. drawing with the Dutch that would have took us through. We should have taken you yeah, through. Have we could have won through against Russia if we yeah. had won the game. Yeah. We lost with about eight or nine minutes left and then gone in against a Dutch team. Three o'clock, I think, in the afternoon. Gelsenkirchen. And you, you, break down, you break down their players, what they had at the time. <sighs> really at the top of Van Basten, Gullet, Rijkaard. Van Basten is as good as centre forward. Koeman, Ron Koeman. Koeman. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic, fantastic. Bouters in the middle of the pitch. Good, good team. And it, to be fair, the goal he scored it was very fortunate one. <laughs> I thought Vim I still Keith, think it was offside. Keith actually yeah. scored the goal. It was, he was, it, Van Basten was about two or three yards offside. Let's yeah. blame the linesman. Yeah. The linesman then. You said Patrick should have saved it up still, didn't you? It's fun and it's cricket with those players. behind him when he added the ball, I actually thought it was going wide and this wicked spin. Sort of took it in, took didn't it? it, it was like, like a Google well, ball. You or said something. he should have saved it. <laughs> there, no chance, there, 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 no, no, no there. <laughs> there are lots of rumours that surround Jack Charlton's uh, reign as Ireland manager. Is it true that in Euro '88 you were initially checked into a nudist camp? Yep. <laughs> yeah, no, we yeah. were in a nudist well, camp. We were in a nudist camp. It was unbelievable. We were in a nudist camp. Anything but that was Jack's World, 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 World Cup in Sicily. We were nearly on the, we were in tents on the mo- <laughs> side of a motorway, weren't we? <laughs> <laughs> what happened in Gelsenkirchen was we were checked into the hotel yeah. and we went in next door. I would go into it. There was a nice sauna and there was a bit of a swamp <laughs> pool. I would all go in there. And as we were in, some of the lads, John, I think, was one of them, yeah. in, in the sauna. Next thing the door opened, this a lovely, come in. lovely young female yeah, yeah. <laughs> came in with very little, nothing. On, I believe. Yeah. So there was a bit of a but panic. You, panic you know what? No, what the way it was, I, I jumped <laughs> that wasn't, in. I'll tell you the real story. I, I, I always used to go Although for a swim. Although you can't tell the real story. <laughs> I swim. No, no, I was swimming in a sauna. So I'm swimming next minute and I, and I look and there's these two old fellas, about 60, walking with the meat and two veg along the way and I thought, what's this all about? <laughs> so I dived out, I, I got in the sauna and I'm getting my head around it and going, I don't know what's going on here. <laughs> next minute, as Packy said, this, this, Michael, nice young lady came in with, with, with very little, well, nothing on, uh, and, and her husband followed. And that's when, when I just got out of it. All the lads are clamoring. <laughs> after, after, after all that, we are so, so thorough and everything else. Pre season, we go away. Uh, training place in Germany. What do we do? The same thing. Go into this beautiful place, all of a sudden, everybody starts appearing naked. Don Howe, Tainy, they go absolutely. You know what can they do? What can <laughs> Don Howe didn't so get naked, just, did he? Not just from Ireland. But, um, Don could lose it, but he did. He lose it that time. <laughs> um, we're reminiscing about uh, Ireland under Jack Charlton with David O'Leary and Pat Bonner and John Aldridge on Five Live Sport until nine o'clock, and then nine till half. Now we'll actually look at the current Ireland team and their chances in this group in uh, Euro 2012 uh, with Spain and Italy and Croatia. It's Five Live Sport. It's two minutes past eight, and Faye Rusco has the news. Online at bbc.co.uk slash 5 Live. This is BBC Radio 5 Live. The Queen has described her Diamond Jubilee celebrations as a humbling experience. In a recorded message broadcast tonight, she said thank you. It has touched me deeply to see so many thousands of families, neighbours and friends celebrating together in such a happy atmosphere. But Prince Philip and I want to take this opportunity to offer our special thanks and appreciation to all those who have had a hand in organising these Jubilee celebrations. The Duke of Edinburgh is said to have watched today's events from hospital where he's being treated for a bladder infection. Prince Edward says his father is getting better. The Queen's former press secretary, Charles Anson, says she'll have missed her husband. She doesn't show her feelings in public, but I'm sure the pleasure of sharing the exhilaration of the Jubilee would have been greater if Prince Philip had been there, but she'll be glad that they were able to share the first half of the Jubilee celebrations at least. In other news, one of the patients being treated for Legionnaire's disease in Edinburgh has died and the number of cases is rising. NHS Lothian says it's now dealing with 17 confirmed and 15 suspected cases. Five Lives' James Shaw has more. 
They have located cooling towers, a total of 16 cooling towers at four locations in the southwest of Edinburgh, which they think could be the source of the airborne drops, tiny drops of water, which are breathed in and which cause people to contract the disease. If it turns out this is not the location and they're still looking for a location, it is still possible that more people could become infected. A U.S. official has said al-Qaeda's second-in-command, Abu Yahya, was killed in one of its drone strikes in Pakistan earlier this week. The news comes after Islamabad called the deputy U.S. ambassador to the foreign ministry to protest against the attacks in its territory. UN aid agencies say the Syrian government has agreed to let them into the country to speed up relief operations. The United Nations says at least a million people need urgent help. And tributes have been paid to a British soldier who was killed in Afghanistan on Sunday. Private Greg Stone from 3rd Battalion, the Yorkshire Regiment, was 20 years old. His commanding officer said he died protecting the lives of others. Thank you, Faye. The sport this evening. World number one Novak Djokovic is through to the semi-finals of the French Open after a five-set marathon against Joe Wilfred Songa. Djokovic saved four match points in the fourth set before taking the decider by six games to one. Roger Federer also needed five sets to make it into the last four. He came from two down to beat Juan Martin Del Potro. In the women's draw, there were wins for Sam Stoza and Sarah Arani. Rafael van der Vaart has told the BBC he's surprised that Rio Ferdinand's not been selected by England for Euro 20. 2012. The Tottenham midfielder reckons Ferdinand's still one of the best defenders in the world. Meanwhile, Manchester United have today confirmed the signing of Shinji Kagawa. United say they'll release more details about the transfer when the Japan internationals had his medical and received a work permit. He's won the Bundesliga twice with Borussia Dortmund. And it's been an historic day for Scotland's rugby union team on their tour of Australia. Greg Laidlaw kicked a penalty in stoppage time to give them a 9-6 win over the Wallabies in Newcastle. Scotland's first victory in Australia since 1982. Our Euro 2012 coverage starts with our tournament preview in Thursday's Five Live Sport from 7 and on Friday from 5. The opening match of the tournament. Live commentary of Poland against Greece. And that's followed by Russia against the Czech Republic. Every game, live. Euro 2012 on 5 Live and 5 Live Sports Extra. Maradona, Maradona, keep him from the ball until he begs. Look behind you, Pro Diego, make the catty bite your legs. Hacky Bonner, he's a gunner, he won't have a single thing to do. Take a pit, Hacky Bonner, Lineker can do that too. Give a sermon to the Germans, he thought that the wall had died. Till they came up against the Irish Now they know it's all a lie Give it a last track, give it a last track Never, never, never say no some amazing rhyming couplets in there. That's Give It A Last Jack by Liam Harrison and the Goal Celebrities. None other than Bono called it the greatest Irish song ever written. John Aldridge, Pat Bonner and David, o- David O'Leary. I went platinum, honestly. Yeah, did it go platinum? <laughs> <laughs> but Bono bought all the copies. It includes... Do you know what the line is about you in that, John? No, I don't know. I can't remember. Uh, the immortal line is this. Johnny Aldridge showed the Maltese he hadn't lost his touch. He's holding back now for the crack until the day we get revenge on the Dutch. <laughs> Beautifully yeah, that. Yeah, Your yeah, rhyming yeah. one was very good, though, wasn't oh, it? Oh, yeah. yeah <laughs> I don't know what it means, though. <laughs> um, uh, was music... A, uh, there are so many songs about Jack Charles and the Irish team around that time. Was music a big part of the squad? Music was a, yeah. music was a big thing going to the game. But, um, yeah. You know, you'd, I think it was Charlie, was it? Charlie, Charlie Lee, Lee, we yeah, have yeah. a tape, put it on, and the boys that... Uh, didn't know the songs, had to learn them, and they learned them very quickly. <laughs> and uh, Mick that was, was a, singing them down yeah, the aisle, wasn't he? That was that was a big thing. Uh, going to the games to get the, you yeah. know, to get it. We get on the coach and travel and just get the relaxation going. And I think with Jack believed that little bit of that was a way of you know taking the edge off you before you got the game. Absolutely, relaxing. Charlie was given a special job. To Who's Charlie? Who's Charlie O'Leary was our kit man, right? Our okay. little kit man. He was about five foot tall. He's now eighty-seven, still alive and doing okay. I spoke to him recently. Great, 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 great mm. man. But his job, as part of, the, even though he was doing the kit, was to get the tape ready for the bus. Yeah. And there was so much panic about <laughs> when to put the tape on, get it on, so that we, we it coincided was us hitting the stadium at the right time with the right song. We hit it once from. I mean, 
in there the other And then we had the physiotherapist called Mick Byrne, who was like, a, he's like a father figure to us. And Mick, yeah. you know, whatever you're you relaxing, he'd, 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 he'd be walking down the aisle singing all the songs, waving his fist, and everything. but it was brilliant. And I always remember, funny enough, after we beat England in Stuttgart in the hotel, the Dubliners came in of a night, and Jack allowed us to have a have a drink till twelve o'clock. And uh, we had the massive big sing song. It was absolutely did fast. you? Yeah, it's fabulous, absolutely brilliant. Um, you can obviously tell by the discussion that we're having that um, the players really wanted <laughs> to get a call up and play for Ireland, and for Jack Charlton, that was a key factor in their rise. I enjoyed the lads coming in as well, and uh, they all did. That was one of the the good bits. I mean, I used to have players phone me up. And I, and I hadn't been picked in the 20 that I used to break, take over, the 22. And uh, they used to say, well, can we still come? And they used to say, yeah, if you want to come, you can come, come. And then on the, on the bus, the, the lads used to sing, we love you, Jackie, we do, we love you, Jackie. And I used to say, OK, we'll stop for a pint. But you're only having one. You're having one pint each. But one of you lot will pay for them. Which they did. No, they did. <laughs> they never paid for. <laughs> it's happy and it's positive. You got the music and you're allowed a beer. Was that? Was there another side to him as well? I mean, was it? Could he be a strict disciplinarian? And you know, people people always thought that Jack was the one that was going to come in the dressing room and have a real go at the players if they weren't doing it. I can never, I can never remember him doing that. Possibly because we did okay as a group. Yeah. Uh, we were well, very you, experienced. You, you, he would tell to, you, yeah. but he never shouted and bawled the way that some yeah. managers did with club yeah, level. Yeah. He never did it. He, he respected us for, for that. He would tell you, he would make, make his point, and if he didn't carry out those points or, or th yeah. that th th those tactics, then he would probably take you out of the team or so on. I'm sure it happened a few. few. It didn't happen to me because I was in goals probably. <laughs> and, uh, and that. But, but he, you know, I, I, think, I think he also thought clearly about the team and about the way we wanted to play uh, and no matter who we played this was our style he always said and I always remember him saying that if he gave instruction to Dave O'Leary to John to me and he gave, said two or three things a day two or three things differently to John two or three things there was maybe a chance that we weren't actually thinking of the same and I don't shape. think I don't and, think maybe and he made it lads, very simple maybe the lads uh, you've just said it, he didn't complicate things hmm. he kept it very yeah. kept it very basic and yeah. You know, do your jobs and we'll be fine. You know your, what jobs you have to do. He didn't go into too much about the opposition. Didn't, you know, t speak for days or even on the day of the game ridiculously too much on them. It was about us, really, wasn't it? Yeah. And what, what, what he was, I, I think he was a fantastic communicator at times. Mm. You never heard from him too much in between games. He didn't pick up the phone to him and say how you're doing, or even if you were injured or you were out of I mean, the team and you're yeah. sick, Dave. But he was the same. I had an injury and I was out for three months with a, with a disc operation. Jack never phoned me up. And when I arrived in, he said, oh, I heard you had a bit of an operation, you know. <laughs> and I could have been, my career could have been finished. Dave was out of the team and for I, such a long I, time. I, I, I hope, I'm not trying to not Jack or no. this is his strength and it was worked I remember and we get back to the night was we played John at Liverpool to win that famous night we yeah. uh, to win the league and on that that was a Friday night and on the Sunday we're playing Hungary yeah. for the Euro Championships and we get back we get in on the Saturday um, there and we've missed training all on everybody and somebody said be down um, go up rest in your rooms the lads have been trained the afternoon on the Saturday come down Saturday evening we're going to watch a bit about Hungary Jack was going fishing in the afternoon mm -hmm. a little bit we come down no sign of Jack no sign of didn't see him and then the following day on the Sunday um, we're having a pre-match about Jack and Jack said well I, I wasn't playing against Hungary you were in that way and he was having such a good time fishing mm -hmm. he didn't come back now the, yeah. the bottom line of that is we I think we beat I, be, I think won we, be, we won two nil, yeah. um, and we played really well. Yeah. And that was his that was his way. Yeah, and we've so, all we've all been through other managers and the way they yeah. do things, and everybody's different. But Jack made it such an environment that we all love coming, and we all love being part of it. And it wasn't overcomplicated, and we trained hard, we worked hard, and we knew exactly. But the other thing about it was that we were all of a decent age. Like I was one of the younger guys in the right. team when Jack took over. I was twenty six years old. Mm -hmm. So ten years later, I was still still around thirty five years old. So we were all a good group. We could handle ourselves. Well, we that could sleep. We could do the things. We didn't have to be muddy cuddled or told what to do we just actually did it so Jack managed us in a way that we uh, treated us as, as adults and, and that, when, that's exactly what I was going to say went, it sounds yeah. like he treated you like growing when it comes, when did it come to the referee blowing the whistle there were players that could play yeah. you know, as well Yeah. let's go to um, the World Cup then 
If I, when I say Italia 90 to, to all three of you, what's the first thing that you would say back, David, first? I just think it was, it was an unbelievable adventure. And the thing what was, uh, John started at the very start of the program, you were asking, we were all hearing what was going on in Ireland. That when the, what we were hearing was any time we were playing, there was nobody walking the streets of Ireland. Mm -hmm. Everybody was just unbelievable there. And um, it, w it was just an unbelievable adventure. Um, of, we're a group of people who just, we never thought we'd get so far and we ended up in Rome. Mm. Um, and Packy started introducing us to the Pope <laughs> in that way. And, you know, um, but it, it was just, it was an amazing adventure, I'd have to say. And the, 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 the Pope one was, 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 was we, we acclimatised in Malta, didn't we? Yeah. For ten, for ten you, can I, can I interrupt? Hard, can I interrupt? You, you're saying about the thing, and I'll let you finish up. We were asked the way the lads travel now, and we're talking a, a great bunch of players. Yeah. And that, we we went to Turkey to play in Izmir, and then oh. we were going after Izmir to go to to go to Malta. Oh. Now, a great bunch. The lads, I seen the lads, the chart, the lads there, the squad going out um, last week yeah. and just gone into Poland now. We we after the game in Izmir, the following morning we got up. Izmir, if we'd had taken a charter like all the other teams, Izmir to Malta, so we're training the base, would have taken about two and a half hours, three hours. We flew from Izmir to Istanbul, waited about three or four hours. Mm. Got on a plane, went from Istanbul to Malta, mm. waited for three or four hours, and then from Ro well, from Istanbul to Rome, sorry, waited for, and then from Rome to Malta. It felt like when we landed in Malta, we were landing in Australia. That has how long it took. And that day. was oh. what would the you know the team put up. Yeah. That was the way we did it. But the lads just got on with it, and we then we had it. Didn't bother us. Didn't no, bother no, us. no, 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 complain. And just we had a, we had a base in we had a base in Malta, and Scotland played Malta, and they went out and what. We went out and played Malta. I think it was about five or six days. I would beat Malta about five nil. I think of that way. But John, John will tell you what. On, on, on the way, on the way to to Rome for the for the actual World Cup, you know, we're, um, we're on the plane and we're talking about Mick Byrne. And, and Mick, Mick Byrne stood up in front of everyone and said, "Jack, look, if we get the quarterfinals and play Italy in Rome, can you get me to see the Pope?" Do you remember, Pat? And Jack looked at him and said, "Mick, if we get the quarterfinals, he said, I'll get everyone." I think it was the pole. final, actually. Oh, well, I think it was the final he meant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the quarter, we didn't know we so, were going to so get all the quarterfinals. We get the quarterfinals, uh, you know, the Dave's penalty, and we, 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 we win it. And uh, Mick Byrne, he, there's always footage of that Mick Byrne you see jumping all over Jack, and he can't get him off. He's got him round his neck, saying, "We're seeing the Pope now, Jack." Aren't we? <laughs> anyway, we didn't think nothing about it. The following Wednesday, Jack Charlton somehow. Bishop uh, yeah. Farquhar was it? Is Bishop it? Farquhar from uh, he, Belfast yeah. and uh, he arranged uh, Cardinal it. Brady. He see the old, I've known this with, with well, but it was, it was, yeah. we were watching Packy and the Pope, by the way. <laughs> so not, nothing else, but no, it was great. We, well, couldn't, we couldn't get a look in. It was honestly, a great, great absolutely fantastic. No, we did it, you know. Yeah. That was Jack what, Charlton for What was you. your memory of Italy more than anything else? For, for me, for me, it was uh, we were in a, in a football nation. Uh, when I compared actually Italy to compare later on when we went to the States in '94, two completely different environments. Italy was a place you wanted to play the World Cup finals yeah. because everybody was interested in football if we weren't playing on a particular night when we, uh, the hype was around us or England it, Italy was playing or somebody else so there was always a hype around it it was fantastic of course we were in Sardinia uh, in, 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 the, in the first game uh, and you know not, not easy and then down in Sicily we were probably in the worst part of Italy yeah. to start off with uh, but we were still the, job, the fans were so hyped up because we had the taste of it in the European Championships now the whole country was behind yeah. It felt as if the whole country was actually in Italy, but they were, and they were partying back in Ireland. But it was just just a wonderful, wonderful occasion. Um, I think the build up to we were never homesick, or we were not, not, I can't say homesick. We were never bored. Yeah, we we mm -hmm. seemed to get on with it. Mm -hmm. We were a great team together. And actually, later on, we went went to the quarter final as we were up in Rapallo up in Genoa, and that's where Scotland was based. And I remember going back uh, talking to Paul McStay and a few of the guys from the Celtic team who was in the Scotland squad, and they were they were so bored being in Rapallo. Now Rapallo's hotel, we replaced them in that hotel. Yes, it was a five-star luxury hotel, <laughs> hotel, the best hotel ever. And I said, "How can you be bored in this? We were down in Sicily in a three-star hotel, yeah. and uh, and that and no we, air conditioning, was no it? nothing. Yeah, but there was a big fan. I always remembered myself and Jerry Payton was rooming together, and in the air conditioning in the room was a big, big fan, and it was going round and round, and you couldn't sleep at night with the noise of it. So you had to switch it off to try to get some sleep, and then it just got absolutely boiling, and it was incredible. And that was the 
the conditions we were in. I remember also uh, after training, we used to put our gloves and jerseys and different things out on the on the balcony. And uh, uh, I was out and we were getting changed and I went out to pick up my gloves and I had, well, I, I won't say I had nothing on, I had something on. <laughs> but I went out to pick up my gloves and the wee woman that cleaned the room opened the door and what that, the door of the of the balcony shut and it smashed everywhere. And I couldn't get, I was standing out naked. Oh, out right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, back And there were people running around. Right. Come on, tell us. <laughs> And Jerry myself. was Tell in the story here. Yeah. Don't move. The glasses everywhere, you know. I was telling him one glove. Believe that all covered. One, one, one glove. glove. <laughs> covered, covered where I should have covered. But this was it. So that was the conditions. But I, I, I couldn't help but laugh when I talked to the Scottish guys then about the hot conditions they were in and they were bored. And we were we were actually totally enjoying the whole experience. Fantastic. Is this story true that that a lorry of Guinness pulled up outside your hotel one day at Italia 90? I'll, I'll tell you a story now. It can be told. Or it can be nice. I think the Thursday night before we were playing Italy in Rome. That was when the Guinness bar came. The Guinness bar came, so you got it up. And right. I hope we could say it now. For, yeah. Um, and the fellow next to me, John Aldridge, is the one I always remember him. We were having food, and we have to come downstairs past this little where the Guinness people have set this bar. And John Aldridge through the mail is saying to Jack... Come on, Jack, give us a half. Let's have, and, he, and he's saying, now, I, I, this is, and he's going, I know what you all know, I give you a half where it will end up. And I know where it'll end up. Jack gave us a half, and I remember two in the morning, I think Jack's on his Wasn't knees. Quite, so he's exaggerating now, he's Jack's, exaggerating. What, is it one, one o'clock? Jack's on his knees, going around the room, I think Andy Towns and his doing something, playing game. The Italian security are looking and thinking, no, this is not the team that's playing Italy on Saturday. Am I getting that right? Yeah. I think you're exaggerating that we did but we did have a we couple of pints again we as did. we had a couple of pints. Let's have a pints. And it was brilliant and because it, you could... You could you could actually cut the cut the air with, with the, the anxiety. Yeah. Because when you get to that stage, the quarter finals forty eight hours away, less than that. And and as a player, you just want it. You want to get on with it. You want to yeah. play it. So Jack, let us go get all the lads come outside and you just can have a, a couple of pints. We we hit one or two under the table, so we ended up having about three, four pints. But what Dave's right, there's twenty or thirty of the secure top top security, please. Watching us, <laughs> we're having bags of glitz. You know, the Ital Italians are, are in bed wrestling and all that. We're having, a, but that's the way we were. Jack knew it would harm us. It settled us down and it relaxed us. And we had a bit of banter that night. Do you remember yeah. the game? We got Jack home with the penny. <laughs> Ninety <laughs> towns, and I, I think, oh, as I said, that's what I was thinking, trying to think about. And uh, it was Absolute just amazing. Quality. But he was dead right about it. You know, give all the half, and then it was it ended up into a party. <laughs> uh, let's talk about how you got to take on Italy, because uh, in the knockout stage, having got through the group, it was Ireland against Romania in Genoa. Both sides scored their first four penalties, and then this. And team off day must score now, otherwise Ireland could be in. Team off day against Bonner, and Bonner saves! Dives to his right, and Paddy Bonner elects to go the right way, and Team off day has failed from the spot. Look at you smiling. That's what, that's, that's, I, I, lo I love watching how players react when they hear commentary. Commentary yeah. of themselves. Have you yeah. watched that? Have you watched that? I watched it. I, I watched it this afternoon. I, I have to say. <laughs> I know. And again, and, and I keep every time I go back to Ireland to do something, people still show it and, and on a on a little YouTube screen or whatever you know. And they, they show it, of course. And it's a fantastic moment. It's a magic um, moment. But I, I was really enjoying that mo that uh, particular shootout because up until that, I had very little to do in the tournament. And uh, the, the Romanian game was a, a tough game because it was sort of around about five o'clock. They had Hadji playing in the game, yeah, who was a really ah, they were a good team. And Hadji was an exceptional player, and he actually played well in the game and had a couple of saves. So I was on a real high going into the penalties. I'd done my homework with Jerry Payton up in the room. I and, yeah, yeah, and I came off... Because uh, Hadji took the first penalty, didn't he? And it, the first penalty was a sensational yes. pe penalty from him. And you, did you think that stage, crikey, they've obviously been practising uh, their penalties. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, we, we were practising our own penalties, yeah. and Dave will tell the story <laughs> and, and, and why he came up to take a penalty afterwards. But uh, I went the right way for every single pen penalty. Mm. And it was down to... And I must admit, Jerry Payton was fantastic, older than me, more experienced. And I had come out of a, of a Scottish Cup final just before that championships and I only had gone the right way for one out of nine penalties it was so we got beat against Aberdeen so I had a bit of work to do and talking to Jerry we had sorted out a, a, a sort of almost a system and how he ran mm. up to the penalty and uh, Tim Ofte came up for the last penalty and I had gone the right way and I was in a real high 
and it wasn't a great penalty. It was a, it was struck about oh. a, a meter off the ground. It, there was no great. It was pace a funny run up. Pat, it was, he, he, he stood at an angle, an and, angle. He, and he stood at a big angle. And I knew exactly where he was putting it. And the great thing about penalties, as you know, a shootout, you don't have to catch it. You don't have to knock it to mm. safety. You just keep it out of the net. But uh, you know, there's a thing actually in that penalty shootout that people don't realise. We had a Brazilian referee. And his, I couldn't have told you now. Yeah, yeah, yeah and he was him. really strict, mm. really strict. And I remember we were all up in the centre circle before the penalty shootout, and the guys were select. We didn't know actually who was taking it. The only person I knew that was taking a penalty was Kevin Sheedy. And they had said to me, right at that moment, that was about 10 minutes before the penalty shootout, he said, I'm going to knock it straight down the middle. And that's exactly what he did when he walked up. Yeah. So he was clued in and he was totally focused. But the referee made us all pull our socks up. I remember that. And they had really strange rules in FIFA. And nobody was allowed to run outside the pen. Uh, uh, stay, they had to stay in the centre circle, apart from the penalty taker and the two goalkeepers. And it was the fourth penalty. And when I saved it, the two guys ran all the way from the centre circle, all the way down into the box and jumped on top of me was Andy Townsend and Tony Cascarino. Yeah. <laughs> And I, I was trying to put him back up there. Say, guys, you've got to go back up there because my fear was that this will have to be yeah. retaken again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was what was going through my mind. And then when I looked round, I couldn't believe it. But I watched. I seen Dave O'Leary no walk, and nobody could believe I that Dave O'Leary. They were saying that we didn't know he was taking a penalty. <laughs> a man who had never had a penalty in his life. I you know what? No chance. I played with that many great players, international wise, club level. Ne never got a look in. I always kind of fancied it. Did you? But, when that game finished at the end of extra time, I ended up with the fifth. I could have been ended. Up, I could have been taking the first. It was everybody in that group said, "I'll have number one. I'll have number two or number," and I ended up with the fifth one. And I remember it's funny, Packy was saying about the. Did you did you say I'll have the fifth or no, or, no, or just, just other people? And got then everybody had gone in and jumped in and taken what they'd taken, and the fifth one was the one left. Uh, honestly, that's the way it happened. Yeah. And. I remember leaving the centre circle and the last fella I passed by was Kevin Sheedy and he said to me, um, don't change your mind. So I was going up there and we had all our supporters behind that goal. There was thousands of them there, all in green. And looking back now and thinking back what Packy was saying, I went and got the ball and said, I'm going to hit it to the goalkeeper's left. Put the ball down and the referee maybe replace again. I remember I couldn't understand. What? We're talking nothing's here step back and I thought and you had to turn around and show him show him your yeah, number as well very, didn't you know, thinking back very finicky very fussy and um, then all of a sudden for the first time in two hours that green of thousands and thousands of supporters are so still behind the goal and I just struck up thought I'm going to hit it with a bit of pace to the goalkeeper's left and um, I was hoping he'd dive the other way or whatever and the ball hit the net hit the net and this explosion behind the goal <laughs> Um, then the biggest mistake standing still, the explosion of all the lads coming, you know, on top of you. You know, and it was just David, an amazing. David, it was very but, funny when you watch it, it. Yeah, because <laughs> you were in the middle of it, and everybody ran from the bench, mm. and all the players from the uh, mm. centre circle all ran, and they all jumped on top of you. And little Charlie O'Leary, if you watch it closely, our, our, <laughs> our, we were talking about Kit Man. He's he's only four foot tall, and he ran, and you could see him running away with his wee short legs, and he got to the group, and he tried to jump up on top of everybody, but he couldn't get up. And <laughs> Kept falling too small, back down. <laughs> too small, and it was so funny. But everybody was in it the staff, the players, the bench you know, everybody. And as, pa as, as, pa as, as um, John and Packy were saying, you know, I had my mum and dad in Dublin. I remember my mum saying, when they seen me coming up for the fifth, my dad got onto the front floor, he was kneeling, nearly praying of that way. My wife stepped outside in the garden, yeah. um, in, in North London. Not thinking, she didn't think I'd be ever taking yeah. penalties. She's thinking, I don't want those lads, I, could, I can't put up with this. But son runs out, he's about seven at the time, and said, Dad scored. And she went, Don't be so stupid. <laughs> Honestly, don't be so stupid. And she comes back in thinking, Is it over? And thinking, Have they won? Not thinking I'll be taking it. And this replay of replay of me, the way I was fortunate, it just worked out lucky. I was on the fifth one. <laughs> Just like I, I can't, I can't, I can't play Packy's commentary and not play David's commentary. So <laughs> yeah, let me play. play let me play. Idea. Let me play David's commentary. Now, if anyone has a cool head on those broad shoulders, it's David O'Leary, the referee, unhappy with where he places the ball on the spot. O'Leary does as he's told. Lung, the keeper waits, crouching, ready to dive. O'Leary doesn't hesitate. Comes up and scores. 
his knees, head to the ground, and it's all green, it's all Ireland. They're through to the World Cup quarterfinals. <laughs> Were you... If you'd have thought about your family and what they were doing back home, would would you have been more nervous? Um, I'm more. I did at the time. I wasn't. But when I think back now, anywhere I go, or the amount of people since then have told me I've met a heart surgeon from. He was in the Mayo Clinic in Rochester in America, and he'd watching it. I have letters from all over the world of Irish people that were watching that. And I think for all the caps out of for Ireland, if I'd have missed that penalty, that's what you'd have been remembered yeah. from yeah. Mm. for, if you know what I mean. And um, it's just as amazing now that anywhere you go and st- still go, mm-hmm. you know, people say about the penalty, I'm sure as Patrick yeah. was saying about that, that's what you kind of, you know, right. remembered for. Yeah. Yeah. You don't you realise it at the time. I think yeah. it's probably worse for people um, watching. It's probably worse for people more watching when they see me so step like, up actually to take it. It's worse for people who miss them, like I did in eighty eight. That's what you get reminded <laughs> from. That's all I ever get reminded from. But Dave's quite right. So know? what yeah, well yeah, because of your experience of eighty eight, what what was going through your, your head, your stomach at that well, time? I was I was I was uh, I come off half yeah. time. I, I, I something happened with, with with muscle like a lazy muscle and I couldn't run. But just before half time I'd done something really stupid. Hadji was brilliant. I thought I'm gonna, I'm gonna maim him. I'm gonna do something to his leg. You know what I mean? So right in front of the bench, I've, you can get on YouTube. I give him this tattle. It's ridiculous. And the referee, when I think about it, I should have been sent off. You know, I've just tried to, you know, nullify to him, him to yeah. help out the lads. I should have got a red card. Was that lucky? You only give me a yellow card. Then obviously at half time I come off, but I tried, I tried to do him before the half time. Well, he, 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 was, he was special that day, and I think like he was saying as a start, he, the ball was moving. Oh, and he, yeah. he, I mean, he was a great striker of the ball, and he'd hit a few strikes at Packy yeah, that you yeah, made a couple yeah, of good saves yeah, from him. Dangerous. They were well out said. But the other thing about a penalty shootout is, you know, I've lived on this penalty save for probably the last 20 years. Dave, maybe to, to a point on, on, on yeah. scoring, but you had Tony Cascarino, you had Andy Townsend, you had Ray Houghton, and you have Kevin Shady, all guys who went up and struck very, very important. Oh, I don't know about that. Did you see Cassis? Cassis, oh, but he no. scored. He kicked, the most he important the thing. He the most important thing. I know he did. He did, and, he, and we talk about that, and, he, and I think the the the, the divot went past the goalkeeper's eye. <laughs> you know, and, and the thing was, I, I was the fortunate one that I could have easily been the first one taken. Yeah, yeah. I was the one that seemed to be on the glory yeah. one, and you were the one that seemed to, yeah, you know, it was fantastic. It was the four before that set it up for you and Packy side. But a lot of bottle. It takes a lot of bottle, and we had five lads who went up there and showed great bottle. We've heard the memories of Packy Bonner and John Aldridge and David O'Leary on the penalty shootout. Let's get Jack Charlton's thoughts. I just went, at the end of the game, I went on the field and I walked across and uh, I said to the, I just said to the lads, sit down, you get a rest. When it's your turn, take the ball, put it down, make your mind of what you're going to do with it and do it. Don't change your mind. Just put the ball down, make your mind of what you're going to do and go do it. Which they did in five out of five we got. When we used to train, no matter where we were, at the end of the game, the, the lads would have a bet on penalty shootout. They would put, they would have a bet. A goalkeeper would go in goals, and somebody would say, "Wait, wait, I'll, I'll get three past you, twenty quid or a hundred quid, fifty quid." And they, they, they used to back them. And me and Morris used to go and sit in the bus and wait for them to finish because they did it all themselves. And I'd said to Morris, because he was complaining one day about us not getting back to the hotel as quick as we should in the bus. And I said, no, no, you never know, Morris, if we get involved in a penalty shootout, they know who's the best penalty takers. And that's the ones that will take the penalties. And sure enough. Well, the betting worked out then. I I tell you, the the lads can contradict me. Niall Quinn was running the book. (laughs) <laughs> and it was we'd been on the road for six or seven weeks and uh, the thing was with Jack we, we trained the morning and we back to this hotel and then get your feet up in the afternoon so we after training we tried to think let's hold on for a little bit and Niall Quinn would get in goal and he'd say three penalties of fiver yeah, that way scored all three and we were all there and we were practicing not practicing that's the way it was going and yeah. then we'd get on the coach and Jack would be waiting there another half hour waiting on you mob or that Quinny would walk up and down the coach saying up X amount of money or down X amount of money and all this and 
the lads that took those penalties in the end were the ones that uh, yeah. Quinny owed a lot of money to. <laughs> <laughs> and, and was, but you was, remember, he was a great goalkeeper. He was, like, but, but you got to remember, yeah, yeah. Ned Quinn's six foot five, yeah. and he put the glove. Once he put the gloves on, he made, he became six foot seven, <laughs> and he stood in the goal, and and you couldn't he just fall down. You, you couldn't beat him. But we started off at twenty quid. But Dave couldn't afford twenty quid, so I had, had to go down to a five or just. I remember to keep Jack joining in one day. Jack, Jack, Jack took a penalty one on it, and uh, he missed, and that was in Melbourne. <laughs> <laughs> couldn't get him taken it again. I also like you bragging about the size of your gloves after your earlier story. Now I've noticed that uh, David O'Leary and John Aldridge and Pat Bonner in the studio with me as we uh, reminisce and remember Ireland under the Jack Charlton regime. We'll talk about that time when uh, the lads met the Pope, and we'll go on to USA '94 as well. Uh, in just a few moments after a news update with Faye Rusker. Online at bbc.co.uk slash 5 Live. This is BBC Radio 5 Live. The Queen has described the last four days of Diamond Jubilee celebrations as a humbling experience in a message to say thank you to those who took part. Her Majesty also appeared on the balcony at Buckingham Palace to wave to well-wishers and enjoy an RAF fly past. Prince Edward says the Duke of Edinburgh is getting better and has been watching events on TV. Prince Philip is in hospital with a bladder infection. One of the patients being treated for Legionnaire's disease at Edinburgh Royal Infirmary has died. NHS Lothian says it's now dealing with 17 confirmed and 15 suspected cases. The potential area of infection is thought to be around 7.5 miles in diameter. Al-Qaeda's second-in-command has been killed in a drone attack in Pakistan, according to the United States. American senior officials say Abu Yahya played a critical role planning operations against Western targets. And the United Nations says the Syrian government has agreed to allow aid agencies into the areas most affected by the violence. The UN estimates that at least one million people there need help. Thank you, Faye. Uh, Novak Djokovic is through to the semi-finals of the French Open after surviving a real scare against the home favourite Joe Wilfried Songer in Paris. Let's get more from our tennis correspondent, Jonathan Overend. Yet again, Djokovic proves why he's the best player in the world, scrambling back from the brink of defeat with some daredevil tennis. As the magnificent Songer desperately tried to close out a thrilling match in the fourth set, Djokovic struck out ambitiously, seemingly oblivious to the gravity of the situation. He was maybe a little fortunate on one of the match points, Songer netting with a forehand as his eyes widened. But on the others, the man who's going for his fourth major in a row simply went for it. The same happened at the US Open last year when match points down in the semi-final. That's six match points he's saved on this extraordinary unbeaten Grand Slam run, which will now celebrate its one-year anniversary when he plays Federer again on semi-final Friday. Djokovic will meet Roger Federer in the last four. Federer also needed five sets to reach the semi-finals, coming from two sets down to beat one Martin Del Potro. I knew it was going to be a tricky match and I knew that margins were not on my side anymore. And that's where I just tried to get, uh, you know, keep playing tough, make him understand how far he still had to go as well uh, because I had a, a very long way and I was able to do all, all, all of those things and I was uh, very happy the way I played, uh, you know, starting the third set. In the women's draw, there were wins for Sam Stoza and Sara Irani. Manchester United had announced the signing of Shinji Kagawa from Borussia Dortmund. That's subject to a medical and a work permit. And in Australia, Scotland have beaten the Wallabies in their own backyard for the first time in 30 years, winning 9-6 in New South Wales. Quick look at the roads and one lane of the M25 anti-clockwise remains shut in Buckinghamshire between Junction 16 at the M40 and Junction 15 at the M4. A barrier is being repaired there and traffic is still flowing well. Now further round the M25, one lane is also shut at Junction 14, uh, that's Heathrow Terminal 4. A car's broken down there. In Surrey, the exit slip road at Junction 2 of the M3 London bound was shut near Weybridge. There was an accident there. Now it has reopened, but there are still long queues back onto the main carriageway. And in Burton-upon-Trent, the A38 southbound is completely closed. A car has collided with the central barrier. That's between Branston Interchange and the Walton-on-Trent turn-off. Police are directing traffic, but the roads seem to be coping well. Bay Rusco, 5 Live Travel. BBC iPlayer isn't just on your computer. You can now watch it almost anywhere. Catch up with episodes on your mobile. Woohoohoo! Our star has arrived. See who impressed the coaches on The Voice on the games console. If you're looking for longevity, you've got to be with me. Spend the evening with the doctor on an internet-connected TV. 
Or find out what's happening in the boardroom on your tablet. Basic business principles went right down the drain on this thing. BBC iPlayer, now on mobile, tablet, internet-connected TV and games consoles. For details, visit bbc.co.uk slash iPlayer. They come from Dublin and Tom Cobb, from dear old Donny Dog. From London, Boston and New York, from anywhere at all. From Parramatta to Fairboy, Slaban to Skibbering. And will this show go up when the World Cup is raised on Stephen? This is Jackie's Army on Five Live Sports. I'm Mark Chapman. We're looking back on Jack Charlton's Island Reign with John Aldridge and Pat Bonner and David O'Leary. Uh, before the news, we were talking about what happened 24 hours before the quarterfinal against Italy when the whole of the squad and Big Jack enjoyed a very special trip. I didn't intend to see the Pope. It was there for the lads. And then a fella came across to me in the, in the church and he said the Pope would like to meet you Mr Charlton would you come and I said yeah sure sure so I went down and I met John Paul and uh, I, I didn't know how to address him I'm not a Catholic but he was a, a very nice man and uh, when we got back we, we went up to the north for, uh, for a, a game one of the games and uh, whenever I used to go to the match to see Northern Ireland play mm. They always, they always used to sit me next to Bishop Farquhar and they used to sit next to him and we used to talk football and everything and what was happening on the pitch and stuff and uh, and I was playing golf and uh, I looked up and Bishop Farquhar was coming out of the building and he's coming to, towards the, the pudding green and I shouted, um, I am Vicar <laughs> <laughs> and he turned and he saw me and he went, oh, hello Jack and he came, because they don't quite well in, and he came across. And he said, oh, he said, I've, I've, I've just come back from Rome. He said, I've been out to see the Pope. And he said, and he asked how you were. I said, you what? He said, he said, yeah, he said, and, and how is Mr. Charlton? Is he well? <laughs> I suppose it's no surprise that the Pope remembered him, is it, Pat, really? <laughs> no, no, no. It was an incredible day, that. For, for us as Catholics, most of the squad, are, yeah. I'm sure, are Catholics, to get the opportunity to go to see the Pope. As we talked earlier, I think he had promised Mick, Mick, mm. uh, Mick Byrne, our physio, that he would take him if we got yeah. to the final. But we ended up in Rome, of course, in the quarter final, so we had a he had to fulfil that promise to Mick and we got there but it was a special day we, we got to the place we got actually into places in the Vatican privately, yeah. privately that, that nobody else would have got in into mm. areas where Mick and Angelo had paintings that nobody seen yeah. and describing them himself and yeah yeah all it was that, really, really good and and when we were in the audience then we were there for about two maybe two and a half hours w waiting and waiting for the Pope to come out and one choir would get up and Sit down and require get well, now we didn't get up to sing. I must admit I must admit that. But anyway, when it came down to it then we got up to see the Pope and uh I was brought up to front because uh I had saved a penalty and there was a lot of hype around it and so on and apparently he was a, a goalkeeper mm. when he was yeah. young in mm. Poland and he spoke to me and we shook hands and that picture then ended up on all the all the papers and all, the, all over Ireland and my mum's got a picture of it up in the house still wow. uh, and that's uh, but but I must tell you a story I must tell you now this I only found the story out about it about a year ago when I heard Andy Townsend telling it uh, we played Italy then in Rome and of course I made that wonderful save and Scalacci scored yeah. Uh, yeah. to give me a bit of stick about it but it was, I thought it was a wonderful <laughs> save myself but anyway Scalacci scores in that and uh, <clears throat> we were in the dressing room afterwards we were very disconsolate and we were sitting around and that and Andy was standing talking to Jack Jack was over at the shower room taking a cigarette and that and uh, I got up stripped off and into the shower and as it went by out of the corner of his mouth he, he said uh, me, he said, the Pope would have saved that one. <laughs> <laughs> now, I only heard this, this story a wee while, about a year ago, so I can't say if it was true or not, but this is what's supposed to have happened, you know. <laughs> so. what, was the, what was that dressing room like then, after after the defeat to, to yeah, Italy? Yeah, we were down, you know, we, 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 know we, we, we knew we'd probably be the expectation, we, we succeeded, you know, we, we, we over, overdone it really. No one expected us to get there, but even still, 
we, we still fancied our chances, what didn't we? We still thought, you know, well, we, we, we can grind yeah. it down. But the problem, the problem with speaking to Jack before and we knew the referee would give us nothing. Yeah. And, and and he he didn't let us down there. I think he gave us one decision for ninety minutes. He didn't. He gave us nothing. You know where the referee was from? Spain. No, he was from Uruguay. Was he sp- oh, I thought he was he said, was a, yeah. South, South was America. He, and I always I don't know how you guys felt, but I always felt that we were never going to no. beat Italy no. in Rome. Absolutely. The quarter final. The Irish team beating Italy in Rome. Yeah. I always felt it was every time a ball was played up to our edge of our box and we challenged it was a free kick against yeah. us every time it sort of came to the edge of our box and Mick or Kevin went up to head the ball there was a free kick against yeah, Kevin he, or Mick he, and, and very to, to cut to the chase back as well I think we all felt as well everybody that mattered it was in the interest in to get Italy through more than to mess Probably, the system well, up it's, it's, it? it's not I, an excuse it's not an excuse but yeah. I mean it suited them and I think everybody was all delighted to get that you know, Ireland yeah. had a day, and there was a relief for the Italian faces. Yeah. I'll it, tell you. Oh yeah, but I think uh, it was Argentina got through. We, yeah, we were Jack, playing Argentina. Jack fancied like, whoever got through. He said you'll have an easy game. But you get the Argentina. He fancied us against Argentina. He, he had it all mapped out. Yeah. Unfortunately, you know the the, the Italians, as the lads quite rightly said, we were never going to beat them. But, but we, we actually fancied our chances. Yeah, we were worried about the referee, and, and, and to be honest, he didn't let them down. As you, as you said, it, you know, despite going out, it had been a successful tournament. You returned home as heroes. Jack recalls the masses of green-clad fans awaiting your arrival in Dublin. We flew in, and the pilot took us up O'Connell Street to see the crowd that was waiting for us, and it was packed. Mm. The whole street was packed, and then when we got to the airport, there was huge crowds waiting for us, and uh, it took us about an hour to get on into the buses and then get down into O'Connell Street, and we went along, and there were the people were climbing. They were, we had to stop the bus a few times because there were kids climbing up pipes and things that were you know planted in there, and we used to have to stop the bus because there were kids that might fall off that. All three of you had witnessed victory parades and and and, and trophy mm. celebrations, whether it be with Celtic or with Liverpool or with, or with Arsenal. What was different about this? I, it was different actually before we even landed. Uh, you know, I, I'd been flying out of Dublin as a boy, and I'd, I'd flown in out of Dublin about a million times. And you, you're at a window seat, and you take off, and you see the green grass. We came over back there at that time, and. You know, so used to, as I say, for so many years landing in Dublin and seeing green grass. This time we flew over the airfield for one lap around and all you could see was people mm. there. And I'd never seen that in my life from landing and taking off at that airport. And we knew what to expect. And when we landed, it was what we were been hearing for weeks and weeks about how the country had gone mad. The whole of Ireland seemed to have congregated around Dublin Airport. Mm. And, and then on our way in, as Jack said, from the getting in, which is about a 20 minute journey from Dublin Airport into O'Connell Street. Took it, you know, a couple of hours because of mm. it was filled with what we've seen on the mall today around Buckingham Palace, mm. the way mm. you've seen that type of thing all the way into Dublin. Then we got into Dublin, into O'Connell Street, and it seemed, Mayhem. as mm. I say, I'd never seen anything like it. And don't, we might never see it again, really. But right. you actually witnessed people up on lampposts, up on balconies, up on maybe two, three story high, and actually grown men crying mm. uh, with emotion and women. It was incredible, the reaction back home. And, and as Jack Ridley says, I wonder what would happen if, if, if we had won something. But it was emotion and it was the pride for our small country to go to a World Cup and take on the best in the world and actually perform and do well, and and that emotion was was uh, or, you know shown mm. in the day that we we arrived back and going in on that bus was incredible. Actually, I got a, a, a little bit worried. I was up and I remember being up in the top did, deck, did, and, did and, and, and and I, I, I went downstairs really? and mm. I couldn't I couldn't watch because I just felt really? there was going to be an I'll make yeah. an accident here. Somebody was going to get hurt because it was just a crush. Everyone all was just the trying way. to get as close as possible yeah. to us, and they yeah. going in. Jack was 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 panicking big time because someone was. Ran across. They were running in front of the bus. It was it was just madness. But you know, it was a huge sense of of pride. Was it different? For, was it different for you from any other open top yeah, bus parade? Yeah, that, 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 obviously yeah. with Liverpool. Yeah. Right? Oh my, this was. Yeah. You know, it, and I'd done that journey into Dublin as a, as a boy from Dublin for Bridges, so long, yeah. and I'd never ever, you know, again, like I say, we have flown over the airfield and you've seen, you know, nobody there to to everybody around the airfield. Then to follow that road into Dublin and then just. 
you know, and what it's usually like. That's to see a million. What, that's see, a million see that what it, what it was like. You know, amount that's of people. A million that, people. It probably got little memories rather. still of when I you drive in there still. That thinking you think back to those days of everybody over the bridges and along the mm. sides and. Yeah. The whole of Ireland seemed to be congregating in Dublin that, yeah. that day. And when you know? speak to people now, they tell you exactly what they were. And we were on that bridge, or we, we were on the side of the road, and they can pick it out I, with their I, families. I, and their families now, at that time, they were kids. Now the families have grown up, you know. <laughs> and they're, they're, they're not embarrassed about it because it was a special moment yeah. in their lives. I, I flew back to Italy the following day from that, and I got on the Aer Lingus plane. Never been so embarrassed in my life. Pilot said... We've got, not that I'm anybody on the pit, everybody stood up and started clapping. <laughs> I was trying to slide down the seat more than, and hide, really. But it was just that way for all of us. Yeah. We, we never, we've been, been, been told about it as the games went on in Italy, how the country had just soccer, had soccer had taken over. And uh, we've seen it then, yeah. the welcome we got back. Uh, and when and we got people, back. people haven't forgot that. Because whenever, I, you know, I'm over in Dublin, you know, so many times and, Wherever you go, and you go for a pint of Guinness, uh, and, you know, one, it's like they breathe, one will come next to you and just say, I have an order, another one, and then the fella across the bar, and he'll just tip his cap and go, thank you for the memories. You know, the respect is absolutely immense over there for, for anyone who played for Jack Charles, yeah. isn't it? Uh, absolutely, and I had uh, the other emotion of going back down to Donegal, where I come from, yeah. down in, in, in the northwest, and uh, a different environment in Dublin, of course, where, where Dave was brought up, and, and, and not a city environment at all, but bonfires out in the hills, and coming and flying into the, the local airport, and the place just absolutely, but, and, and the people were just so overjoyed to be part of it, and, and the great thing for me, I felt, and I'm sure the guys are the same, is that it wasn't about us, it, it wasn't just me, we were doing this on behalf of everybody, mm. and everybody was on Involved in it because the fans felt very much part of the team. Do you wear the team? Actually, sports amazing, isn't it? My, my, my isn't parents, it? we we did, lived in a small little place in Dublin and never thought anybody knew where we lived. My parents said to me that evening, about an hour after the game, it was it was like people coming to the churches, not knocking up at the door. There was that many people coming to knock at the door, and, and my mo my dad took my mum out for a drink to this local that they used to go to. Nobody'd ever say anything. They went in, did their usual thing. The whole pub stood up and started clapping. <laughs> and the fellow who'd never bought them a drink in their life sent a bottle of champagne <laughs> over and they don't drink that. They said they were so embarrassed. And oh. that was just, you know, the way. Let's, uh, let's, my producer's doing that. He beautifully structured this show, but there are so many stories. That's gone out of the window. I'm just, I'm just listening and listening and listening. So let's move on to USA 94. Um, after nine o'clock, we'll actually look at the current Ireland side and maybe what their chances are in Euro 2012. But as far as uh, the World Cup in America was concerned, it took only 11 minutes for Ireland to make their mark against the Italians. Point couldn't win that, but the Irish do that one is. The run of play at Troy Hunt, and it's a chipper. It's got the backspin on it, and it drops down over the top of Paliuka into the net. It was Roy Houghton with a chipper, according to our, <laughs> <laughs> according to our American uh, colleagues. I wonder if you um, you went into that Italy game with, even though it was four years on, with a, with a, a little bit of sense of let's try and get our own back on them after what happened in in Rome. Uh, it was, yeah, it was. Um, it wasn't as biased. Obviously, for what we expected mm. in, in 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 Italy. What we I'll tell you what the big the big thing that hit me when we we, we got to the hope Giants. You're gonna, hope you're going to say now what I'm. Thinking the Giants stayed, and we were told to expect seventy percent of, of Italians you've, you've in that, in this stadium, and we're thinking, oh, it's going to be a bit intimidating. You know, might give the referee problems. We went in there, and I'll tell you what, it was seventy percent Irish. Was it? it was unbelievable, and, uh, and straight away you have seen the lads grow another six inches tall thing yes you know the referee might get intimidated by our fans now so we're even the balance out from the referee's point of view yeah. it was a cracking game you have to say it was really yeah. close game but, but um, I'm glad John I'm glad John said that because if you say to me what do you remember yeah the brilliant result mm. but the thing that really stands out to me was the the dominance of being told that Italy is going to take over the whole stadium yeah. it, was, it was Ireland and I remember a few days earlier uh, again a friend of John's um, Kenny Daglish were in it, met Kenny in New York and we ended up having uh, something to eat or that or talking in, the, in an Italian restaurant and the Italian was saying oh you are, actually got no chance and we're going to take over the stadium so it was built up that way and that it was frightening my wife sat in the stadium and she sat with a person that had come all the way from Australia an Irish person to watch it and she said all around her 
was people from all over the world Irish connection who for somehow got tickets and it was like playing a home match there mm. and that that's my memory of the ma- of the game were, were you a different group of players because um you'd had the experience of euro 88 and mm. and world cup 90 you you weren't i don't mean this in a disrespectful way but there, there wasn't the naivety there wasn't the fresh face of, of tournament football with you guys in yeah, this one we had changed the squad around a little bit yeah. also we had Brian, gary kelly phil babb <coughs> jason yes. young jason mm. They were the young young group. Roy was coming, sort of starting to become a main player yeah. in the team, and he was the captain. So we had changed the team around. Mm. Some of the older guys had left. Some of us, John, would have been probably the oldest member yeah. of the squad. Mm. Uh, we were coming probably to the final stage of our our international career, and we had prepared down in Orlando, which was really difficult because the weather was incredibly warm down there. Did you, you know? get much to do that game? You know the way you were saying no, about the no, other game? No, 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 not a was? lot. I remember one save maybe in the game and that, but it was about trying to organise and keep yourself... Um, and uh, But what I, what I really was going to say, um, we had prepared in Orlando, uh, and I know fans who had travelled out to, for the game in, the, in New York felt it was so, so warm. For us, it wasn't too bad. Mm. We were coming up from mm. Orlando into that New York heat, but it wasn't as bad. So we actually could cope with it. And the funny thing was, and not many people know this actually, when we went out to start the game, the referee blew the whistle and we, we went out the, out the door, turned left, and as you turn left, you go down into the tunnel in the giant stadium, and the Italians were standing waiting for us. And as we went down, we were wearing the same colour strip as the Italians. And then quite incredible. We had, we had white strips Oi. on. They had white strips on. Now, it was a blunder by the, the FIFA... Uh, people themselves because we had we had met them I think Charlie and, and the guys had met them earlier in the day and we were told our colours yeah. but we were forced to go back inside change our strips within probably about oh. five minutes into green and the Italians were still waiting for us in the tunnel when we came back out now for us it was an advantage we had to rush around a bit of course and yeah. trying to get our strips yeah. on and so on but the Italians were there and boiling heat still standing in the tunnel and they didn't start off as quick or as demanding as we thought it would mm. in that particular game. Was it, was, we had, we had was, the was, there a, was there something unsettled in the camp? Was there something going on as well? Was it the typical Italian build-up of... Oh, the within being, the Italians? Yeah. Was I'm not the so sure. Was being given them stick that. or something? I'm or, not so sure. Baggio was, the, back, was yeah. the main guy yeah. up front. He didn't really play well no. in the game. Uh, the Baresi, of course, who big, was big still playing. Big, big For any, any young lad who wants to watch a centre-half play and learn from... That's the most complete performance I've seen from a centre half that day from Paul McGraw. Mm. He was incredible, yeah. unbelievable. Everything he was never getting trained. He, he, he was, he was he incredible player, and never trained. And do you know what? That 90 minutes, you just watch how he defended. It was just the, the best performance. And Ray's I've ever goal, seen. and Ray's goal was an incredible goal because you know we, we played a lot of long ball. And Jack actually told me before the game, and uh, and leading into that, uh, Steve, I think Dave Seaman was was probably not Dave, um, your Arsenal goalkeeper. Um, With, we, uh, English David Seaman David Seaman yeah, yeah David Seaman he started off the, 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 going out to the box and kicking the ball long and suddenly Jack said to me you need to go out to the box and start kicking it long and I'd never pra- I've never done that in my life and suddenly I was trust to do this uh, in, in the World Cup and the start of it so anyway that's how we played the game again knocking it into, into areas and Brazy was playing in the back if you remember and, 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 and he struggled but the ball broke to Ray and he kind of Almost half hit it mm. somehow. Well, and left, it looped over for swinger, swinger, wasn't it? Swinger, it's, it's, it's John said. Left foot, you know, yeah. Yeah. And it's his only goal he scored. But left foot, Luca was in goal. He was so far off his line. He was about eight or nine yards off his line and just looped over the top of him. And it was the only way he probably could yeah. have got beat with that yeah. shot. Incredible. But his celebration was a thing. His celebration, the way he ran, the way he did this roly poly, and he, got up there. <laughs> he didn't know what to do, just <laughs> rolled over. It was a fantastic. <laughs> he was there a while, the while, wasn't he? Dave was actually his knees, he just rolled over. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, Packy, you mentioned uh, Orlando, uh, of course. Or- Orlando in the blisteringly hot Citrus oh. Bowl. Uh, was the uh, stadium for the match against Mexico, the mm. game you lost 2-1. Um, but I think, as, as most of us know, the match was better known for a touchline bust-up that Jack mm. Charlton had with a FIFA official, and John was right in the middle of it. There was a guy in a blue coat and a yellow hat. I remember, I remember a blue coat and a yellow hat. He came on and he just snatched it out of Charlie's hand. And he said, I, FIFA man, I check this. John's waiting to get onto the field. But the ref the referee can't let him on the field because he hasn't got the sheet that the guy's got and is buggered off with. <laughs> and all the, the lads were just standing about. 
And I, I went to him and I was saying, I want that sheet. That's, he's got to get that. And he's going, you, I, 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 I report you. I report you. And apparently I got fined, but I never saw it. Never paid. <laughs> you never paid it? No, no. <laughs> you um, did get fined, actually. We both got fined. Did you? Did you yeah. get fined as well? Two thousand five hundred dollars. Jack got fined twelve thousand five hundred dollars. <laughs> did it? He's, yeah. never, he's never seen it. Paid it. <laughs> no, we didn't pay it. But 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 this old generous Irish people. I only found out how unfairly we'd been, yeah. which it was unfair. Was, what what yes. happened? Definitely. They had the whip round for me and Jack all around <laughs> Ireland and collected ninety six grand <laughs> <laughs> in all the pubs and clubs. That's true. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, it's true. Uh, I mean, it was actually quite serious, wasn't it? The, it the was. whole water bottle thing. And it was. Um, that was on Jack's mind as well. You know, there was a lot of things. But what happened in the Mexico game, we couldn't, this, this heat that we're going on about, we couldn't play our normal setup in the faces. The, the, you know, it was just, you couldn't recover when you, when you no, made a run, you dead. couldn't get your breath, you couldn't recover. So our game in the faces, we couldn't do it. With so no they panic. got more time to play around us. Yeah. They were used to the heat and they played absolutely brilliant. You've got to give them, you know, credit where, 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 where it's due. But the reason why they won was, was the, the heat factor. Absolutely. Definitely, yeah. I but remember, I remember John Dennis Irwin was playing right back. And he was up against one of the Mexican guys, and he was just running around. And Dennis was a really, really good player, good player. That's great, it, yeah. great player. He was a great defender, one on one. He just couldn't get near him. And uh, and and Campos, remember Campos and goals? Yeah, he was yeah, the smallest yeah. goalkeeper ever. And we said, oh, we, we, we'll 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 take this guy on. We'll score. <laughs> we couldn't we couldn't get into the box to do yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. You had the most ridiculous goalkeeping kit in that. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. That's but you were right. glad you didn't have that kit. To Actually, work. I got a, I got my son got it, and he has it somewhere in the house. <laughs> <laughs> Is it, it, was it the heat that did for you, do you think, in that tournament in the end? Yeah, it was just ridiculous, wasn't yeah. it? It was, it was so hot. 12 o'clock yeah. in the afternoon. Yeah, and, and John made the good point of the game was about pressing game and yeah. getting into people, not letting them yeah. play and all that. But if you, if you did it, um, you, you couldn't do that for 90 minutes. No chance. No, couldn't do it even for 45 yeah. minutes, really. You could do it for five minutes. Yeah, uh, it was, it was, and, and it was the heat killed us. Yeah, because yeah. I had no plan B, but we, that was our big but issue. My, yeah. my mates agree with me, I don't know. I actually thought that that, that squad that plays with the experience we had and the young talent coming in, I thought it was was as good as the the ninety the nineteen ninety squad. I really did. You 